Welcome to the Conversations on Healing podcast, where host Shay Bider speaks with renowned healthcare leaders, practitioners, and thought leaders to explore the world of wellness, the incredible powers of self-care, and what it truly means to heal today. Join us on this journey to become more whole, healed, and connected. All right. Well, welcome, Howard. So happy to have you on the Conversations on Healing podcast. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. I appreciate it. So I'm very much looking forward to this dialogue with you because I know so many of our listeners either themselves or have a loved one who struggles with pain. And your understanding of pain is so powerful, particularly um, in terms of helping people who have chronic pain that they have not been able to resolve sometimes for many, many years. So I want to start right there with this issue of pain. And I want to have you differentiate for our listeners um, two types of pain. So there's what's often known as structural pain, and then there's often also neural circuit level pain. Could you elaborate more on the distinction between these two types of pain? Yeah, it's, um, it's amazing how much we've learned about pain in the last decade or two from neuroscience. And um, not a lot of this basic neuroscience has actually filtered into the medical community. I didn't know anything about this, but about 20 years ago, I started looking at working with people with pain, looking at pain, learning about pain. And what we found out is that you can't understand pain unless you understand how the brain works. Because it turns out that pain is something that is generated by the brain. And this is, it, that just saying that is shocking and unusual because when you cut your finger, you get pain, but it's not actually your finger that's causing pain. It's the brain that's causing pain. And we know that because a lot of times people may get an injury and not have pain at all. And I'm sure people have actually experienced that or known somebody who that's happened to where they've had an injury. It's happened to me. It ha I remember my son fell and cut his chin and he was bleeding and we had to point out um, you're bleeding. <laughs> well, that's a good thing that he didn't notice that right off the bat, right? <laughs> yeah. But well, it, I, yeah, go ahead. That the brain causes pain. And so, but when you think about how the brain works, it's, it's how we see, we don't see with our eyes, light comes in our eyes, but our brain creates the images that we see. We, uh, you know, sound waves come in our ears, but that's not what we hear. We hear because our brain interprets that sound and puts it together. And when we feel something in our bodies, uh, our brain has to interpret that. And our brain has to decide, literally decide if we're going to have pain or not. And so once you understand that, which is, you know, mind blowing. It is. But once you understand that, then you can begin to see that not all injuries cause pain and not all pain is due to injuries. So the people that have, are listening to this podcast probably have had some amazing and wonderful experiences in their lives. But they've also had heartbreaking and heart-wrenching experiences in their lives. And when you have heartbreaking and heart-wrenching experiences, you feel that, right? You can't have a heartbreaking experience and not feel it in your heart or in your chest. But sometimes you can feel it in your neck or in your back because that's how the brain works. And modern research shows that stress and emotions activate the exact same parts of the brain, the exact same circuitry of the brain that is activated when you have a physical injury. So the pain that results from a physical injury is the same as the pain that results from stress or an emotional injury. It's the same pain. Right. I think this 
piece is so fascinating. And, you know, for years, I think we've um, stigmatized this. We've said, well, you know, if we can't find a structural issue that's causing your pain, then it's all in your head. And as it turns out, what you've just described is, of course, it's in your head because that's how pain works. It works through the brain. <laughs> so it's always all in your head, <laughs> whether, whether it's structural or psychological or emotional. And so I want you to talk a little bit about this connection um, between chronic pain, emotions, and stress. Um, because as you were beginning to describe, that is a very important understanding. Yeah, yeah, you're so right. Um, what we tell everybody is it's, it's not all in your head, because when you say it's all in your head, it's implying that it's not real, or that it's fake or imaginary, or that you want the pain, or it's your fault somehow, or that you're weak, or that you're crazy. And none of that is remotely true. It just so happens that the brain creates pain when it's under stress, whether it's a physical stress or an emotional stress or both. And so that pain is real. And it turns out that the circuitry for physical pain exists in the brain. And so the people that I see are really happy to know that their pain is real, you know, they, they, you know, to sell someone your it's in your head is, is, is horrible. It's cruel, really. It's not true, but they're also happy to know if it's not structural, they're happy to know that, oh yeah, it's in my brain, which means it's reversible, which means there's hope for changing the actual physical feelings of that pain, even if it's very severe, even if it's very long lasting. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, Howard, if you could share a case history or an example from your many years of doing this work with somebody who was, you know, struggling with chronic pain, came to you under, had developed this new understanding of how they could work with their pain and then was able to, you know, essentially uh, get rid of that pain experience that they'd had for a very long time. Do you have a, a story that you might be able to share with us? Yeah. Um, there, there are so many, <laughs> uh, there was, uh, there was a woman I, I recall who was, had a, a lot of back pain, severe back pain for about 10 or 12 years or so. Um, and it began when she had a fender bender car accident. Um, but the funny thing is, is that she, when she, when she had the accident, you know, her neck was, was hurt, but the neck pain went away in a few days, but her back started hurting after that. And when I, when we assessed her back and we assessed the MRI, which had some abnormalities, but everyone has abnormalities on MRIs of their spine. Uh, all, all people do, uh, that wasn't the cause of her pain. Uh, and the pain had this characteristic where it would kind of turn on and off sometimes or it'd shift or move, it was worse with stress. So there was a variety of clues that told us that this pain she was having was not actually damage to her back, which is very, very common. In fact, most people with chronic pain, and this is another shocking statement that I had no idea was true when I started this work 20 years ago now, most people with chronic pain do not have a significant structural problem causing it, such as people with chronic headaches, fibromyalgia, chronic uh, neck and back pain, chronic stomach pain, chronic pelvic pain. Anyway, but it turned out at the time that she had that accident, at the time she had it, she had a new boss and her boss was micromanaging her and, and, and you know, uh, yelling at her and just causing her all sorts of stress at work. And it turned out that her father was the kind of person in her childhood who was micromanaging and critical and yelling at her. And when she got that car accident, her brain just went into this mode of protection and wanting to help her. And it's so weird that your brain would give you pain to help you. I mean, come on, why would that make any sense? But the brain can't tap you on the shoulder and say, you know, my dear, you know, you're going through a lot. You really need some rest. Maybe you need a different job. You know, you need to deal with all this stuff that's going on, right? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. It just gives you pain and you have to figure it out. Uh, and it turned out it was this, the, the emotions were much higher because of her childhood. Anyway, so she started doing this work and her pain completely went away within about three or four months, which was amazing. She was so happy. Mm, it's incredible after 10 or 12 years of after suffering. 10 or 12 years. And then four years later, she emailed me and she said, you know, my pain came back, but I know what it is. My husband was diagnosed with cancer and I've been caring for him for the last six months or eight months and he's declining. And I'm so grief stricken and heart stricken and it's so hard and there's so many feelings and I'm angry and I'm worried and, and sometimes he's irritable and I don't, I don't want to be angry with him. And my pain came back and she said, I know what it is. I can tell it's, it's all the emotions that are coming out. It's coming out in, in this pain. Mm. And she said, but I, I talked to a friend. I, 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 um, I dealt with some of the emotions I was feeling. I started writing about them to get them out and express them. Mm -hmm. And the pain went away. And I was able to care for my husband without pain to the end. And it was just a beautiful, beautiful story of understanding this work, I thought. How lovely. And, you know, that illustrates uh, another area of conversation that I'd love for us to touch on, Howard, which is, what are some of the um, treatment methods, resources, tools that you give to people when they come to you? And you know, once you've kind of ruled out that there's an underlying structural issue and you realize, okay, this is neural circuit pain, um, what are some of the treatment methodologies that you favor? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really important. The most important thing is what you already said. The most important thing is getting the diagnosis right and knowing for certain, because it is very difficult to recover from chronic pain if you think you're physically damaged, if you think that there's something critically and irreversibly wrong with you. And unfortunately, most of the medical profession has the notion that all people with chronic pain have irreversible physical problems. So physical therapists have told people that they have all these irreversible problems. Physicians, pain doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists have all under the impression that, and sometimes it's true. Some people have metastatic cancer that is causing irreversible pain, no question about it. But like I said, most chronic pain isn't. So if we can figure that out and help people understand it and understand how the brain works and understand and make, sometimes they can make the links between what's gone on in their life and when the pain started or when the pain got worse or when the pain shifted from the stomach pain to the headache or from the shoulder pain to the back or from the fatigue to the anxiety to the depression, all these things come into play. And when they can really see that, there's often this sense of hope and optimism and liberation even, freedom to say, oh my God, I can get better. I'm okay. There's a lot of stuff going on in my life, but I'm okay and I can make it. That's the most important first thing. Hmm. Right? right, that understanding of I'm okay, I'm fundamentally okay. Exactly. And also I would imagine um, subsequent to that is a recognition that this can be healed, that this can be um, changed, that I'm not stuck with this for the rest of my life. Exactly. And so given that, um, if someone comes to you, is it a very kind of self-analytical process that they go through where they're looking at what are the underlying emotional triggers? What are the stressors? Is it a process where they do journaling, where they um, look very um, carefully and almost, you know, a diagnostic way at what is creating this stress and emotional uh, difficulty inside of me? Or what does your process look like when someone comes to see you? Right. Sometimes people do that. And sometimes that can be very necessary or even not necessary, but helpful. But at the start, we're not doing any of that. <laughs> at the start, after this whole assessment and diagnostic process that we mentioned and, and offering hope, et cetera, 
we're helping people to reduce fear because it turns out that the neural circuitry of the brain feeds on fear. And so uh, what we're helping people do is eliminate the, the feedback loops that reinforce the pain and make it worse over time, make it spread over time and make it persist over time. So if a child falls off a bike, they look to you to see if they should cry or not. And if you freak out, they're going to cry. But if you smile and say, hey, you're okay, you know, you're all right. You're fundamentally, like you just said, okay, let's get back on. Let's go ahead. And that is the simplest description of the process, which is very, extremely simple. It's not always easy. It's not easy to not freak out when your kid falls off the bike, <laughs> but you have to do it because you need to give them the correct feedback. And our brain is looking to us for the feedback of what's wrong. And every time, and people in chronic pain are giving their own brain, their relationship with themselves, thousands of messages every day. This is bad. This is wrong. I can't stand it. I'm, I'm hurting. I don't know what to do. I don't know what's wrong. All these, all these negative and fearful messages. And when we start replacing those with every time they, they uh, for example, I had back pain several years ago and hurt every time I bent over. It turned out there was nothing wrong with my back. My brain was predicting that pain and creating that pain as a conditioned response. Every time I bent over, my brain was going pain. And so I, what I, once I figured that out, every time I bent over, I said, I'm okay. I'm okay. It sounds so silly and so stupid and so simple, but <laughs> it's so powerful because you're giving your brain the truth. And if you believe that and understand that and know deep in your heart, I'm actually okay. Yeah, it hurts, but I'm going to keep bending. I'm okay. Little by little, we give them tons of exercises to do to help them unwind the fear and unwind the frustration and unwind this excessive focus on the pain. Mm -hmm. Because basically what you're giving your brain is freedom and recovery and optimism and hope. And then you can focus on the things that are most important in your life. And your brain will sometimes very quickly and sometimes very gradually turn off those neural, those neural circuits of pain. So that's the first form of treatment. It doesn't really have to do with emotional trauma or emotional expression or anything like that. And for most people, that actually works. That's fabulous. And so um, examples of how you teach someone to break that fear cycle, would that be like you just described in your own story, positive affirmation, kind of sending new messages uh, to yourself? Um, what would be other examples of how yeah. you teach people to break that fear cycle? Right. It's, 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 it's sending the messages that I'm safe and I'm strong and there's nothing wrong. It's, it's those affirmations when you're going through your day. It's meditative exercises to separate from the sensations and observe them rather than freaking out when they occur. It's saying, it's saying to the brain, it's, it's not dreading and fearing the pain all the time. It's, it's saying, oh, I'm having, this, I'm having these weird sensations. It's changing your name for it. I'm having these, it sounds so silly, but I'm having these weird or funny sensations. It feels like an energy or a, a tingle, but I'm okay. I'm okay. And I'm using this as an opportunity. So every time I get these sensations, that's great. That's good because now I can train my brain out of it. It's an opportunity. It's like you can't learn how to ride a bike by watching someone ride a bike. You have to get on the bike and you have to experience falling. You have to do it. And so we're helping people do this in their lives with this completely different mindset. And we're doing another thing is graded exposure where we're giving people little exercises to do. If it hurts to sit, we'll have them sit for five seconds with this super strong po positive attitude. And that's it. And then 10 seconds and then 15 seconds. And pretty soon their brain starts to learn that they're okay. It's a training process. Hmm. We say it's like training a puppy dog. You know, you're doing it with kindness and gentleness and patience and trust and, and persistence over time, knowing that you're going to be all right. And I'm curious, Howard, why you think there's been some resistance to this way of approaching pain? Because 
um, it is so effective. I, I know a number of people who have utilized, you know, your methodology or something along the same lines and have been able to heal pain that they were living with for years. And so I'm so curious why you think Western medicine has um, really struggled to receive this in and to accept the value of this way of understanding how the brain works and how it's processing things to deliver messages of pain. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, first of all, it for many years, and the person who really started this work is someone who's been controversial, but is one of my heroes, Dr. John Sarno in New York City. And he's passed away now. But Dr. Sarno helped, helped thousands and thousands of people recover. So, but these were all stories. They weren't really studied in, a, in randomized controlled trials. So medicine, modern medicine is like, well, where's your research? Like you say, well, you've known people and that's really powerful. And, uh, but we have now done the research. So now just in the last couple of years, we've published uh, several randomized controlled trials uh, in chronic pain showing that this work, the, uh, and there's two types. One, one component of it is the pain reprocessing work that I just described. The other component is we haven't talked much about yet, but you were talking about it earlier with the emotional expression and dealing with underlying emotions that sometimes it's necessary, um, but not always. And, but we've published randomized controlled trials using both of those methods, showing that these methods are more effective than standard therapies for chronic pain. So we now have the data, which is really fantastic and exciting. But science doesn't change overnight. You know, doctors have been doing things the way they've been doing it for a long time. And frankly, the, I, these ideas are counterintuitive. It's hard not only for physicians and physical therapists and psychologists to understand this, it's also hard for people with pain. It's very hard because you're hurting and this pain is real and you know it's real. And it can be overwhelming in your life. And now here comes somebody along saying, oh, here's a, here's a cure. And no one else said that, or they say, yeah, it's in your, it's in your brain. But when I say it's in your brain and you're hearing it's in my head, you know, that's not going to be, that's not going to be easily latched on to. And so the message has to, it's going to take time. Any, any change, any change, any change takes to a tipping point. It takes people to gradually understand it and learn. And this is going to take time because it is so counterintuitive but it is effective. It does work. And, you know, you can't keep a good idea down forever. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, this makes me wonder, I have um, a friend who's an orthopedic surgeon and I'd asked him a ways back, you know, cause he's done so many back surgeries. I said, you know, what's your success rate on your surgeries? If you look kind of on, you know, over all the thousands of patients you've worked on over the years, what's your success rate? And he said to me, it's about 50, 50. He said about half of the time it works and about half of the time it doesn't. And, you know, this conversation makes me wonder deeply if the 50% of the time that it's working was when there really was a structural issue, um, that was, that was the true root of the cause of the pain. And if that other 50% was when that was kind of misidentified, because as you described, there's a lot of I mean, it often gets called abnormalities <laughs> in medicine, but really just differences in our spines and in the way that they look. And when you see that, sometimes um, that can be interpreted as something is wrong with your spine, when in fact, it might just be something that is you know, slightly particular to your body. Um, mm -hmm. And so I feel like sometimes that's created confusion where something is identified as a structural issue that may not necessarily be so. And so there can be some misunderstanding there. And so then it's treated as though there's a structural issue when perhaps that wasn't quite accurate. And so now the real cause of that pain, this underlying fear or stress or emotion that was actually the true trigger isn't being properly addressed. And so that would help to explain in some cases why he wasn't always succeeding from these surgical procedures. Because I, I think that's quite fascinating, you know, that, that, that was the success rate that he could identify over many years with thousands of patients. 
Right. Most of the most of the most of the back surgeons, there's an adage: a third of people will get better, a third will be unchanged, and a third will get worse. That's really bad. Now, if you take appendicitis surgery, how often is it effective? Like 99% of the time, it's easy, right? There's you do it right. The problem: it's not that the surgeries were done poorly or incorrectly. These are successful surgeries, te technically, but they're not working to help people pain get better. Now, sometimes back surgery is absolutely necessary. There's no question about that. Yes. In general, that's for, if you take out people with tumors or infections or things that require urgent you know, back surgery, you take those out and those are rare. If most back surgery is either being done for pain shooting down the leg due to a very large herniated disc or pain that's in the back. So surgery that is being done for a severe, super large bulging disc or herniated disc that's actually causing the pain and neuro, not only pain, but neurologic compromise of the, of the foot in, in this case, uh, that can be extremely necessary and extremely helpful. But if you're, you know, I know lots of uh, spine surgeons and if they're, <clears throat> you know, they know, yeah, we can fix that. But when you have the chronic back pain, they know, like your friend is saying that, well, that's, that's iffy. And why is that? Well, first of all, degenerative disc disease is seen in 50% of people in their 30s who are, have no pain at all. It's seen in 70% of people in their 50s and 90% of people in their 70s who have no pain at all. So degenerative disc disease is being blamed for back pain when it shouldn't be. Bulging discs are seen in 40% of 30 year olds, 60% of 50 year olds and 80% of 70 year olds without pain. So just a bulging disc even is very, very common, is normal really in people without pain. Same with spinal arthritis. So there's so many of these factors as you point out and so it's not only, and in fact, when you're operating on somebody for pain, you can make it worse if it's non-structural pain because, not because something went wrong with the surgery, because it creates more fear. It's like an assault. You know, it's horrible going through this long, more pain from the surgery and the rehab and all that stuff. It can also make people better by the placebo effect. And it turns out placebo effects are very, very common, very, very powerful. And if you have non-structural pain or neural circuit pain, a good placebo is kind of all you need. It can really work. And I've seen this amazing times, uh, many times where we know that the treatment that was given was not actually structurally effective, but the pain went away mm -hmm. because it shifted that, shifted the neural circuits in the brain. Some of those sham surgeries are fascinating um, where you see someone was suffering from so much pain. They were enrolled in a study where they were actually given a sham surgery. They didn't know that they knew they were in an experimental trial, obviously, but, and they, they did nothing. They created like a false incision. I've seen these on knee surgeries. They created a false incision. The person thinks that they were operated on to, you know, address the underlying issue and their pain completely goes away afterwards. And actually nothing medically from a, a structural perspective was accomplished. And that component of how the mind works is just extraordinary. And I think there is, we have such a long way to go in medicine to really understand the power of the mind, how it can create these unbelievable changes in people um, that are, you know, entirely through a shift in the way that they think. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, like you say, there's been a couple studies with a sham surgery with knee pain that showed that both groups got better, but to the same degree, whether they had the quote real surgery or the sham surgery. That it was also shown in two studies with, um, it's called kyphoplasty, where you inject, um, glue and uh, stuff in the, in the vertebrae after a compression fracture. The sham group did as well as the real group. Uh, it's been shown in, um, in uh, other situations as well. Uh, we haven't, no one's ever done a sham back surgery trial <laughs> yet. It should be done, frankly. Um, but a lot of times, what, like with the knee surgery, those, knees, those knee operations are still being done. 
they're still working. But the question is, why are they working? It turns out a lot of the effect is actually due to placebo. Antidepressants have amazing effects. 75% of people who take an antidepressant for, de for mild to moderate depression get better in the short run, 75%. But about 72% of the people who take placebo get better in the short run. That's a huge, a huge placebo effect, which shows that we have the power. And from my point of view, is that we have the power to help ourselves with things like chronic pain, like anxiety, with depression, chronic fatigue, insomnia, things that medicine hasn't really been able to um, clearly define as simple things that we have simple solutions for, like appendicitis or a kidney stone or whatever. Exactly. And it's wonderful to start to tease out and differentiate what are these areas where we have more power than we have recognized. And as you named, you can see that in depression. You can see that in anxiety. Obviously, in your work, you can see that with chronic pain that's non-structural. It's like there are these areas where we have tremendous, in a way, untapped power that we're not recognizing and utilizing um, to help ourselves to heal so we can feel better. Right. It's a question of us. What happens is there's these spirals, and it's very easy to fall into a negative spiral. You know, when life, you know, kicks you in the head, you know, when things don't go right, when unexpected traumas happen or unexpected, um, you know, uh, illnesses. And, you know, who's prepared for that? Nobody. Nobody's prepared for that. And especially if you've had stress or trauma earlier in your own life, it's kind of a piling on effect, an accumulation effect. Because early life stress and trauma imprints the brain to be more, more on edge, more hypervigilant, more fearful. This danger alarm mechanism in the brain is set to be more sensitive. And so when later things happen in life, it's more likely that they are triggered. Like that story I was telling about with the woman who had a critical father and then a critical boss. If you have abandonment in, in childhood and then you get abandoned by a spouse or if you have an illness in childhood and then you have an illness of a child, these things are really common to create this spiral. And the spiral, this vicious cycle can go from the, the, the pain or the fatigue or anxiety or depression to the fear of it and the focus on it. And it becomes such, it becomes the major, the major problem and it's just your brain's way of alerting you, but it's hard to see that. So the problem gets worse and worse. But what we're doing is doing the opposite. We're helping people get into a positive spiral where they can see that, you know, life may not be all that perfect or, or great in some ways, but nevertheless, I'm okay. And I can feel a little bit better when I, when I focus on, on joy, when I focus on, on love and when, I, when I'm compassionate to myself right? Because so many times people like a lot of the folks that you, you see and work with, they're giving, 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 and there's nothing left for them. Mm -hmm. And they've been giving so much. And their brain is going like, Oh, what about what about you? <laughs> Where do you get a break? Where do you get a vacation? Where do you get some respite? And then the brain is like, well, you're not taking this time for yourself. This sounds weird, right? But your brain is literally saying, you're not taking time for yourself. I'm going to make you take time for yourself. Here's some really bad back pain, so you have to lie down. I mean, that sounds crazy, but that's exactly what's happening. And when people look at it from this lens and understand that that's actually how the brain works, the brain is supposed to work that way. It's supposed to protect us. Pain is necessary. It's there to protect us and alert us and alarm us. And sometimes it's there to alarm us of, us of an injury, but it can also be there to alarm us of this emotional threat or, or, or emotional insult or, or, or just total burnout and, and, and lack of self-care and, and being assailed by so much, being pressured, being trapped 
between your work and your family, being trapped between your kids and your spouse, being trapped between your in-laws and, and um, you know, the other in-laws or whatever, you know, it's just, these are real things that happen to so many people. And mm -hmm. everybody has a mind, is these mind-body interactions. Everybody does. You know, when you get embarrassed, your face turns red. What's that? You know, you have a stressful day at work, you get a headache. What's that? These are, these are everyday normal things that everybody has. I certainly have. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That mind-body connection is real. That is for sure. Um, I love a couple of things you said there. I love that idea of the positive spiral. And I love the idea of teaching people how to cultivate a positive spiral, right? Because we often unwittingly train ourselves into negative spirals. And when you think about the ACEs data, so adverse childhood experiences, and there's been now a, quite a, a bit of research that shows when you've had significant traumas in childhood that we can actually predict with quite a bit of accuracy, things like heart disease, increased risk for cancers um, later in life. And of course, there are positive things you can do to intervene to try to disrupt that cycle. And what you're discussing, you know, kind of the creation of a positive spiral rather than a negative spiral, um, I think are actually some of the practical interventions that people can use to, to break those cycles of early childhood trauma that then continue in these negative spirals throughout your lifetime. And the story that you illustrated with that woman, you know, who had early childhood trauma, and then she saw it play out with her boss. And then she saw it play out when her husband was ill. It was like a recreation of those old triggers and old stories. On the one hand, you could see it that way, but as she was able to recognize and then intervene, right. As she was able to recognize and now work with it consciously, actively, proactively, you know, she could then change the pain. And that is that right there is so powerful recognition, understanding you can actually interrupt these cycles. They're not permanent. You're not stuck with it forever. I think that's really powerful for people who are listening to this to understand that they can, they can take some of these, you know, things into their own hands and it's very useful information. Exactly. If you, if you think of the symptom, the anxiety, the depression, the pain, the fatigue, the insomnia, if you think of that as a message, like when a smoke alarm goes off, we don't get mad at the smoke alarm, it's just doing its job. It may be loud and annoying, but it's doing its job. What if you think about what we're feeling as a message? What if you take your hand and put it over your heart and close your eyes, and you look inside and you ask yourself at the deepest level, what is this trying to tell me? What do I need to know? What do I need in my life right now? What's going on that, that is, is bothering me or worrisome? How, how are other people treating me or how am I treating myself? that needs to change? Is there something there? And just wait and just see what happens if you just, from a kind and caring and loving perspective of yourself, look for, is there something I need to know? And whether you're in pain or not, I think we should all be doing this at times. You know, if you're, if you're not having pain, but nevertheless, you're having stressful life situations. Well, if those stressful life situations keep going on and on, and you're not getting any respite, and you're not taking care of yourself, then you're probably going to get pain sooner or later. So if people do that, then they can begin to see what's what they need. And if they can see what they need, if it's, if it's standing up for themselves sometimes and saying no, if it's saying, this is too much, I can't handle it, I need help. If it's, uh, I need a respite, I need to get away for a bit. If it's, I need to do something at work or change my job, um, you know, I need to change a, a, a how, how I'm communicating or what kind of communication is going on between my spouse and I, then you can, that's something that maybe you can do something about and maybe you can fix. And then maybe that would be the key 
to helping you feel better in your body because now the neural circuitry that's protecting you in your brain is like, okay, fine. <laughs> it's all right now. Mm -hmm. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Thanks for paying attention. Exactly. Well, and isn't that at core what this is really about is it's trying, our brain is trying to get us to pay attention to something. And, you know, I'm, I'm interested in, I believe her name is uh, Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett. And she looks at the brain and um, how it impacts our emotions. And one of the things that she's studied with the brain is how good it is at predicting, but that those predictions are often inaccurate because they're built on past history. And so once those um, predictions kind of get established because of past history, we can start to think and assume, you know, negative things are going to happen that aren't necessarily bound to happen. And so um, she looks at ways that you can disrupt those negative patterns, essentially, and then change the way that you feel. Um, yes. And it has very similar, I think, implications to the work that you're doing. But those capacities for disruption, disruption of negative patterning are very powerful. and. I, I'm feeling and noticing more and more how as we begin to really utilize the power of our mind to frame experiences, not to deny them, not to um, pretend away what's occurred, but to look truthfully right at the heart of what's happened and identify our individual capacity to interplay with what's happened and to say, Yes, that happened. And, and here's the good things about it. And, you know, here's one of the good things is I have a lot of tools for health and healing and wellness. So um, I'm increasingly curious about that interplay when hard things happen and how we can utilize that to help us to heal from accidents, injuries, difficulties that arise. Yeah, it's uh, what you're saying is so true and so powerful. Um, a lot of it re revolves around the idea of resilience and how people have been, have led their lives. And people who are more resilient are people who've had someone who believed in them in their childhood. Maybe they had difficult things happen, but there was somebody who believed in them, somebody who loved them, somebody who gave them a place where they felt comfortable. Uh, it's people who've had experiences where they overcame difficulties. And we all have overcome difficulties. Learning how to walk is overcoming difficulties. Uh, and so, so this resilience that people have, they can use that because they've, they've been able to overcome barriers in the past and now they can overcome them now because if they conceptualize the problem as something that's solvable or fixable or at least manageable, then they can conceptualize it that, well, it's, it's probably gonna be okay. That's a critical component of it. Another component of it is what control do I have? What can I do about it? Because people who feel like they have no control over the situation at all are gonna be more likely to fall into that negative spiral. That there's nothing I can do. And it's viewing challenges as opportunities. So it's viewing challenges as opportunities. It's seeing that there is some control I can have over the situation, even though I can't maybe control certainly what happened. I may not be able to control like the woman I was saying that her husband was dying. That wasn't controllable. But what could she take control over that could make a difference in both of their lives? That's the critical part that leads to this idea of, well, you know, some people call it post-traumatic growth, mm -hmm. where you take a situation and you can actually grow from it, even though it's hard, really hard. And I think we, no one wants to be thought of as making light or being glib about the difficulties that people um, experience. You know, most of my patients, the vast majority of my patients, I, you know, I just feel so much for them because they've been through so much. I wouldn't, can't even imagine so many of the things that they've been through. Um, but that's like the core of this work is compassion. The core of this work is, 
is feeling compassion for people and giving compassion to people so that they can have compassion for themselves. Yeah. You know, when I think about all the families that we've worked with in the hospital and how many parents, well, they were caregiving for a child who was seriously ill um, that I have known personally that suffered from serious back pain. It is extraordinarily high, the number of parents who, you know, as they were, we have treated so many parents in the hospital that as they're sitting there with their child, they can barely, you know, sit still because they are hurting themselves so much. And, you know, that's exactly why in the work that I do, we look at everything in like whole family, whole systems ways, because there can be this illusion, you know, that if the child is ill, just focus on the child, but you can't, when that child is ill, that parent, those loved ones, those caregivers, they are so deeply affected by it. And it creates so much pain and suffering, you know, physically as well, you know, and it's, it's fascinating to see how those emotional and physical connections, they're so tied in exactly in the way that you're describing from what you've learned is that the brain, even in fMRI studies, it's not able to clearly differentiate between, you know, sort of psychological suffering and physical suffering, that it looks basically the pattern in the brain, the read is the same, right? Exactly. That's exactly true. And what happens is that there are certain emotions that are acceptable. It's acceptable to be sad and grief stricken if you have a child who's ill. It's acceptable to ask for help most of the time. It's acceptable to, um, to be angry at the world, to be angry at God or whatever, right? To be angry at the person who, you know, if there was someone at fault or whatever. But what's not acceptable is to be angry at your child. But who has never felt anger at their own child? How can you not? And that is, is so, that can be so wrenching for a parent to feel like they're angry at their own kid, which is only normal. Everyone does at some point sooner or later, especially when there's so much stress in the family. And it's really hard for to hold that emotion in and say, oh, that's not acceptable. I shouldn't, I can't feel that. I'm a horrible person. Then you feel guilty for feeling that you're angry or you're angry at your spouse or all the stuff that goes on that are normal human emotions that come and go. But what we're saying is that the reason that people have these neural circuit problems, the reason they have these mind body problems is because they're human. They're just human and they're doing the best they can to cope with difficult situations. And when emotions come up, there's a lot, as you point out, lots of tools to safely and health and in, in a healthy way to identify and express those emotions so that they don't spill out in anger at somebody. That's not the goal here. The goal is to allow yourself to feel the emotions and sometimes writing them down is the simplest way. Writing it all down and shredding it, letting it go. One of the simplest ways of dealing with emotions that are really normal, but if you feel you're a bad person for having these emotions, it's gonna eat away at you. You know, and I think what's so fascinating about your body of work, Howard, is that if we really embrace this, if we really embrace the mind-body connection, if we really understood how much pain is just the brain, you know, kind of giving us that uh, signal and information based on fear and stress, et cetera, if we really understood that, we would likely be able to use some of these interventions. We'd likely need fewer surgeries. We'd likely need fewer drugs. And people could likely heal certain types of pain much more quickly and effectively. And so it really, you know, gets you to think about what a dramatic shift that could make in terms of um, both our healthcare system and also the, the vast number of uh, people in our country who are regularly experiencing significant, I mean, chronic pain is huge It just within the United States. And if we move beyond that internationally, I mean, Pain, chronic pain is a huge global issue. If you take uh, neck pain and back pain and anxiety and depression, you have the top four out of five causes for disability worldwide. Mm -hmm. 
And these are things that modern medicine has done a great job of many things, but these, this is an area where modern medicine has not been able to have significant impact in simple ways. And like you say, when you think about the woman I was talking to you about earlier, where she had back pain when her husband was ill, she didn't go to the doctor. <laughs> she didn't have to go to the doctor because she knew what it was. And uh, she was able to solve that problem without medical intervention, testing, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, once, once people understand this, it's, it's pretty obvious. You can see it. Once you, first of all, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Once you know about this mind-body connection, you can see it in yourself, in your family, in your friends. It's very, very common. And millions of people are suffering. But a lot of that suffering is needless. And there's no question that this model, and you talked about Dr. Uh, Lisa Baer, who's, who's really at the forefront of the neuroscience on this, and, uh, one of my heroes. And you know, we talk about how getting this information out into the public is only going to be only going to be helpful for people down the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I wonder um, if there are, when you think of specific populations of people that are experiencing chronic pain, like people with fibromyalgia would be an example. Are there unique or distinct kind of treatment um, methodologies that you use with uh, fibromyalgia that would be um, kind of uniquely um, different from, let's say, somebody who has migraines. Um, so I'm curious about, with the different manifestations, how that affects your treatment methods. Uh, the, we're treating the brain. <laughs> and the brain works the same way in everybody. And whether the manifestation is migraine or tension headache, fibromyalgia or abdominal pain, irritable bowel syndrome, chronic pelvic pain that's sometimes described as pelvic floor tension or pudendal neuralgia or vulvodynia, uh, chronic neck or back pain, um, uh, chronic fatigue, chronic insomnia. We are seeing, and this is controversial, I know sometimes people get, get upset, but we are seeing obviously tremendous numbers of people now with long haul COVID syndrome. Mm -hmm. And these syndromes are very, very similar to the same mind body syndromes that we're seeing in people with uh, what's called POTS, POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, brain fog, fibromyalgia. Um, this whole range of things really all kind of goes together. And so there's tremendous opportunity to help so many suffering people but the treatment is all the same. And that's the beauty of it because, because many of the people that we see, it's not just one thing. They don't just have back pain or migraine. They have many of the things that I just mentioned. And fortunately, we can treat them all in the same way because when we can reconceptualize the problem as a solvable one, when we can change our affect about it, how we feel about it and how we think about it, and we can calm the brain and focus on on life and on living with as much peace and joy as we can, then the brain will calm down and all of these different symptoms will calm down. Sometimes one may get better before the other. <laughs> it's, it's quite variable, but, but people do get better. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, Howard, with all the work that you've done in this area, how you've come to understand healing or how people heal based on your practice. Yeah, um, I think of healing as having four main components. One is having a definition of the problem that is agreed upon by everybody, you know, like the, the person with the problem and their provider, whether it's a therapist, whether it's a physician, whatever. It's agreement on the problem. When there's agreement on the problem, that is a really powerful thing. And sometimes it doesn't matter if the agreement is, like some people may agree it's X and other people may agree it's Y. They have different views on what to call it, but it's that agreement. Um, and then there's a technique. The second thing, then there's techniques that you can do that you feel confident about and that you believe in and the practitioner believes in it. 
And then there's the caring relationship. There's a connection between people, between the helpers and the people you're working with. Like in the woman I was saying, she didn't have, the, later she didn't need to see a physician or anything, but she sought out a friend who helped her. And then the fourth thing is hope and optimism. And so if you take this hope and optimism and this compassion and caring, and you take agreement that the, of what the problem is and that it's solvable and these techniques are going to work, that's, that's the things that makes healing. And for some people, it might be my chi is messed up and acupuncture is the treatment. So that makes sense, right? It's a technique that goes for that. It's not what I do, but it works but it works because of that, because of this expectation and this agreement. What I do is very similar. We have the agreement that this is a neural circuit problem and these techniques will work and we go from there. So that's, that's the way I conceive of healing. I'm so glad that you brought up this idea of, of hope in your definition of kind of these four parts of healing. Um, I always loved, I don't know if you ever read the book, The Anatomy of Hope. I think it's Jerome Groupman, but it's a beautiful book about the power of hope in medicine and helping us to heal. And he references a number of, of research studies that show the power of that and how, how actually damaging and detrimental it can be for a doctor to kind of um, intervene negatively and in a way deny someone their hope because that hope is actually a, a powerful healing tool. And I think we've discussed in a number of ways in this conversation, the significant importance of the way that the mind has a power to intervene in serious illness and to help us um, through clarity and positive you know, thought processes, breaking these fear cycles, et cetera, to really transform human suffering on many, many, many levels in ways that maybe previously we hadn't understood we had that power and capacity. And ironically, I feel like the more we understand the way the brain actually works, the more that we get insights from functional MRIs. And we see things like, for example, the studies that show when you experience um, pain, like if they create you know, a little painful experience on your arm, um, through poking you with something. And if you're holding the hand of a loved one on your functional MRI, your experience of pain is mitigated. It's much less when you're holding the hand of a loved one. And we can literally see that, you know, functionally in the brain, we can see a lowered pain response than if that loved one isn't there and they do the same pain trigger. So I actually adore the, the, sort of bridging here of what we're learning through science and as kind of technology and science continues to advance and then coupling that with a deepened understanding of our, these inner realms, these inner capacities, this ability for mind body um, approaches and strategies to health and well-being. And I feel like if we could utilize all of that in the long run, will be able to do what your patient did, which is she didn't have to go to the doctor when her husband, you know, was suffering from cancer and she was experiencing back pain because at that point in time, she knew how to treat herself. And yeah. that's a beautiful thing to be able to do that, to learn. There is a time and a place to go to the doctor. There is absolutely a time and a place for surgery and medical intervention and drugs and all of it. But there's how powerful to not necessarily have that always be the default. Yeah, for sure. I, I'm so glad you mentioned that study about the handholding. Tor Wager, one of my colleagues, did that study. Mm. And, um, and it shows, like you say, the power of the brain. And so with mind-body conditions, which are extremely common, most chronic pain is my, our mind-body conditions, as I mentioned, uh, that's all we need is to change the power of the, is to use the power of the brain to change the symptom. But some people have autoimmune disorders, you know, that are structural, but it turns out the brain can also affect the immune system. So there may be ways that people can help themselves through the power of the mind uh, for illnesses that are beyond quote, the mind body, like autoimmune disorders, like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. Um, there's some, a whole series of studies on Parkinson's disease that shows 
the power of placebo interventions in Parkinson's disease, which is amazing. And so there may be room for us to use, as you mentioned, the power of the mind in disorders that are clearly um, structural and in this case, what we would call a neurodegenerative disorder or MS, power of the brain to affect that. So there are th things that we can use. We can use this model not only for the purely straightforward mind body type conditions like mm -hmm. chronic headache, irritable bowel, um, chronic back pain, fibromyalgia, et cetera, but also some of the other conditions. And maybe they, maybe they may not be curing necessarily those, but you can use them with medication. But what we're talking about is the difference between healing and curing. Sometimes curing is not possible because the medical illness is relentless and overwhelming, but healing is, is the state of how we are in our, in our lives, in our bodies, in our relationships. And that kind of healing can occur with, uh, to more or less degree, but often to a significant degree by using the power of the mind and by using the power of, of compassion and human connection. Beautiful. I'm, I'm glad you brought up MS because I think that's actually a fantastic example. I believe it's Dr. Terry Walls who um, changed the entire course of her MS. She's a physician by training and everything in Western medicine wasn't getting to the root of um helping her to the degree that she wanted to be helped with the symptoms from her MS. And so she implemented all sorts of diet and lifestyle, all these changes that had remarkable impact on the expression of the disease. And she's written and, you know, published extensively on it now has whole protocols that other people with MS can explore. And, you know, I think how wonderful to remain open-minded, right? I don't think we have to be definitive and understanding exactly how all of this works yet, but how wonderful to remain open-minded. And so I really, you know, in closing, Howard, I want to, I want to thank you for your courage. I want to thank you for your willingness to stay open-minded and to really look at, huh, what is working? You know, what is helping patients? And to be willing to accept that when you've seen, you know, significant changes and then to drill down and try, try to understand more deeply. Okay. So then why is that working? What's the underlying mechanism? What's the cause? And so I, I very much value, and I'm um, wanting almost to speak on behalf of all the patients that you've helped and served, you know, that took a lot of courage for you to, in some ways, go against some of the kind of normative culture and say, nope, I think we can allow ourselves to explore this more fully and um, embrace some other possibilities here. So I, I appreciate your tenacity and I want to thank you. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. I appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you so much for having this conversation on healing with me and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Take care. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Conversations on Healing podcast. If you haven't yet, please go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your preferred podcast platform and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. It helps so you won't miss an episode. See you next time.